Hello and welcome to Hashtag No Limits. I am your host, Shelly Kino. Hashtag No Limits is about people whose society has placed limits upon, but who have busted through those limits. Ophelia says in Hamlet, we know who we are, but not who we will be. And I believe that to be 100% true and that there is no better example of that than the caterpillar turning into the butterfly. The caterpillar literally dissolves into its cells, then it reforms into a butterfly. As if that's not difficult enough, it then has to struggle and fight to get out of the cocoon in order for its wings to be strong enough to fly. While that is no easy task, neither is busting through the limits that society has placed upon a person. So today we have a recurring guest. She was with us last week, Shannon Yakabachi. And I hope I said that right because I've been practicing. (laughs) Um, Last week, she shared a tremendous amount of information with us about fetal alcohol syndrome disorder, spectrum disorder, sorry, Um, (laughs) FASD. And this week, she's going to give us a a brief synopsis of that for anybody who was not with us last week or hasn't had a chance to catch that episode. And then um, she's going to tell us about her own personal experiences with FASD within her family and within her friends and things that she has seen of those people busting through those limits. So Shannon, thank you so much for coming back. Thank you for having me. This is so fun. (laughs) Good. I love to hear that. Um, And I'm so glad we we had such a great conversation last time and it was just so eye opening for me. And I really hope it was the same for many of the people who watched it or will watch it in replay. Um, So just give us a little synopsis again of who you are and what FASD is. Okay. Well, like you said, my name is Shannon Yakabachi, and you did say it right. And uh, yeah, right. And (laughs) I am. (laughs) I celebrate um, every little win. (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) That's what we do. Um, So I am first and foremost a mom of six children and also a pseudo mom, also known as Mama Shannon, to a whole lot of other friends, you know, kids. And um, I am the founder of Diversely Designed, which is my company where we work with um, individuals that have been impacted by FASD and their families and um, coaching them through how to see behaviors um, as symptoms of the brain-based disability that they have. Um, I'm also a master IEP coach in which I help people, um, parents navigate the IEP process and in seeking the right supports and services for their children in special education. Um, that is kind of in a nutshell who I am. I have, um, I was also a foster and adoptive parent as well as in a blended family. So we're kind of like just quite the, um, constellation of, you know, a situation in our home. And four of my children have, um, varying degrees of effects of fetal alcohol, um, exposure, prenatal alcohol exposure, um, and have been diagnosed with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, You wanted to know what that was. So just as a recap, um, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is basically a, it is a spectrum. It's an umbrella term um, for when a um, child is exposed to alcohol in the womb. So when a mom drinks alcohol of any sort um, during pregnancy, that alcohol does cross through the placental barrier and impacts the developing um, fetus. So it is a spectrum. So it does impact everyone differently depending on the timing, the type, and um, you know, the timing, the type, and the amount that is consumed. So that's kind of a real quick Reader's Digest of prenatal alcohol exposure and FASD. Yeah. Wow. And I like that you said the Reader's Digest version because <laughs> I read the Reader's Digest and it is it's so funny. I don't know why. I just found that funny that you said I, I might have dated myself because I don't know how many people really that's read the true. Reader's Digest. And I thought about that when you said, I'm like, oh, I probably sound really old. <laughs> it's okay if you are, so am I, because I knew exactly what you were talking about. <laughs> And that was a phrase that was used often. Just give me the Reader's Digest version. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, so that's yeah. wonderful. So, yeah, um, I, I definitely encourage anyone who might be watching this episode, as I said, who did not watch the first episode with Shannon, to go back and watch that episode because they're, it's just enormous, the, uh, uh, the impact and the amount of information that you shared, but the impact for sure. And um, I, I 
I'm, I'm still just blown away by when I think about, you know, like you said, the timing, the kind and the amount of alcohol and how the variances in how that will display or not. Is it, I don't know that I asked you this last week. Is it a guarantee that if you consume alcohol of any kind during pregnancy, that there will be some effect? Um, no, there's not a guarantee because, um, and I think that's part of the challenge because some people, some of us are unaware and we might be willing, willing to take the risk, maybe not. Um, but there is, uh, there's so much evidence that proves that it could happen. So the best thing to do is not, but there's no guarantee because there's other factors, which makes it hard to diagnose the epigenetics, um, environmental stressors, all those things that also impact development. Right. So there's no guarantee, but the statistics, if I say that right, because I always <laughs> stumble on that word, it's it, a very it's hard word for me yes. to say. It's a tongue twister for sure. It is a tongue twister. And um, the statistics point to such a high probability yeah. of that happening. Yeah. So. And something I remember you mentioning last week, and I don't think I heard you say it this, this time, is um, it isn't just the mom. Sometimes, too, if the dad has had alcohol, um, that can also play into it. And of course, that one's a lot much, a, a lot more difficult to to um, acknowledge or recognize. But also, I believe you said last week, if the dad drinks, they won't get the diagnosis. Is that right. correct? That is correct. That's correct. I mean, the if the father drinks um, prior to conception, there is a definite impact on sperm count and higher possibility of miscarriage, a higher possibility of certain types of developmental disorders that can take place. However, the diagnosis of the child will not be FASD. There could be other diagnoses that are given to the child, but because if mom has completely refrained and it's solely dad who had had drank prior to conception, then the diagnosis will be different. Okay. And some of the things, um, and, and this will be, I think, the final part of the recap of last sure. week, and then we'll get into you personally and your experiences. Um, what are some of the diagnoses or eligibilities even for special education that can be um, misdiagnosed, maybe is the right word, or maybe not. Mm -hmm. That's correct. F FASD and, or could be what? Okay, well, there are actually over 400 comorbidities or overlapping wow. diagnoses. So okay. it could, I could, but to give you the top few, the most common are ADHD, um, autism, um, oppositional defiant disorder, that's obviously a very big one because of the behavioral symptoms. Um, those are the top three. There's also anxiety and depression. However, understanding that anxiety and de de um, depression would be like a secondary. Um, sure. And anxiety and depression, it's not saying that someone is going to have, because, they're, because anxiety and depression can be their own individual so, but the, a lot of individuals with FASD are also diagnosed with anxiety and depression, just okay. so you know, like dysthymia and those types of things. Yes. Yeah. Wow. And, so, and then there could be emotional disturbance when it comes to special education as far as, as far as a qualifying category. Um, currently, there is no qualifying category under fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. However, we are trying very hard to get that done, especially here in California. Yeah. yeah. So that, and I think that will be a good thing. Um, and so, yeah, I think that the approach will be different if someone has FASD versus autism or FASD versus ADHD. And yeah, so, and just to clarify, you're not saying that just because somebody has a diagnosis or an eligibility of ADHD, autism, um, or any of the other things that that automatically meant that there was alcohol consumed or that <laughs> fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. No, 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 because there are true, there is true autism, you know, that is autism. There is right, true right. ADHD that is ADHD. Um, it's just that the root cause could be impacted by alcohol exposure and maybe not. But what I'm saying is a lot of misdiagnoses right. or overlapping diagnoses take place. And yeah. I, so I'm not saying that, oh, if you have autism, it's because of this. Absolutely right. not. 
I had. Okay. Just wanted to clarify that because I knew that that you were not saying that, but I wanted to make sure that that was very clear to everybody that that is not what you were saying or not what we were intending. So I think that gives a really good recap of last week. Mm -hmm. Um, And so let's jump into you personally with your experiences with your children and with your organization that you have and and maybe some of the um, people that you've seen through there. Okay. So um, story time, I guess. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Story time. Um, get, okay. your, get your drink, get your blend. I know, right? Up. Just, <laughs> up everyone. just grab your cup of coffee or whatever. Um, so basically, um, in a nutshell, my um, I had always desired to adopt children. Um, and I went through the process. We went through the process um, to actually do foster care. We decided to do foster care because... Um, regardless of adoption or not, we wanted to help families reunite, um, and, and help families, you know, stay together. Um, however, in the process, um, if a child was, became available for adoption because, um, unification was not going to happen, then we would be plan B, you know, we would be willing to adopt. Um, and so when going through all of the training, we really never heard about FASD, you go through all of the training and there was just this little blurb about, oh, could possibly have this. Um, in a training that we sat we sat in, um, they held up doll babies and they held up a doll that looked a certain way and said, if your do- child that comes to your home does not have these facial features, they don't have FAS, period. Oh. And okay. so we were so misled on what it was. And um, so it never really crossed my radar. Right. So fast forward, I, you know, I have adopted my um, twins and we were seeing, um, we had gone through some other, you know, things in our, in our family dynamics and I was seeing a few things, but really didn't, you know, attribute it to anything that had taken place. I mean, they were, you know, we had so many other variables taking place. Right. So um, we're in the, now we're in the school setting and starting to see some things like, meltdowns over homework and, you know, just the things that just, you know, tears over just sitting there trying to figure out, I mean, just little things that are like, what, you know, and at first as a parent, you're like, okay, we we need to get this done. Let's, let's, you know, stop the drama. I mean, some of us think, you know, think that way, you know, okay. But then there were, you know, there's that, that gut feeling that something's not right. Yeah. So, um, what happened was there, um, started working on, you know, my child had, had an IEP, but only for speech. And, um, then we started seeing more, um, challenges as, as my child went through the, you know, the grade levels. Okay. Of course, as grade levels increase, so does the expectation and the responsibility and all of that. Right. And the requirements to remember what you had learned in the past. So therefore we started seeing some challenges and um, there were some challenges with um, parent, I mean, with uh, teacher student altercations or uh, teacher student, like student feeling put down because Mm -hmm. of the terminology used by the teacher. Um, Just lack of knowledge, you know? Um, So then it was kind of a struggle in that fifth grade, but then we moved on to sixth grade and that's when we started seeing way more like that's I mean we're already you know children are already like thrown into like this abyss of junior high right. and now not where there's no more hand holding there's no more um you know help it's like here's your agenda write down your stuff and do your work um yeah. also they're going through all those changes and they're dealing with you know regular peer pressures and peer whatever and then you've got the teachers that are like, okay, let's do this, right? And here's all your stuff. And now we have transitioning to classrooms. We have, tr- you know, transitioning to teachers, tra- you know, everything's different. Right. So yeah. with that, we started to see more increased of um, student teacher altercations and mm-hmm. student teacher, um, I don't want to say humiliation, but that's how my child felt, you know, because of this, we're going to put you in the corner over here. Right. And have you work by yourself? Well, yeah. who in sixth or seventh grade wants to be put in a corner, right? right. I mean, nobody exactly. wants to be put in a corner anyways, but now you're in sixth grade and all your peers are there. Right. So, of course, there's going to be some 
come challenges. So then fast forward, my child started to have anxiety and panic attacks and grades were decreasing and all of these things. And so finally come seventh grade, I mean, I couldn't get my child out the door. And um, so fast forward to, I think it was, was it eighth, seventh or eighth grade? I think it was eighth grade, first day of school. I mean, we had a lot, a lot of challenges in seventh grade. We get to eighth grade, first day of school, okay? And my child will not get out of the car. Mm-hmm. And I said, okay, then we are going to the doctor. We're going to figure this out. Something's yeah. going on. And she, the, you know, my child had had lots of panic attacks leading up to all of this. And there was already, a, you know, a pull out of school because of the stressors and all of that, you know, just trying to do like um, school at home, like whatever, you know, whatever they do, the medical, right. there's some, I forget the name off the top of my head, but you know what I'm talking about. Like and the homebound kind of instruction. Like, yes. Yes. Okay. Like for a medical exemption type thing. So you have to do it at home. Right. And um, we went to the doctor and immediately my child was diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder. Boom. Okay. Right out of the gate. Oppositional defiant disorder panic attacks, general anxiety disorder, all these things. Okay. And um, so as a parent, you're thinking oppositional defiant. So she just has a problem with authority. Right. (laughs) Right. Like that's what parents think, right? This is what you're thinking. And as I researched more and I just was like, it's not, there was something like, it's not that. Like it's not, that she's trying. And so we really had to dig deep and it wasn't until um, honestly, Around this time, we started adding to our family. We started adding more children and my little ones. And they were, ex- um, even though they were little, there was something I'm like, wait a minute. And so it made me go back to some of the paperwork. And someone had mentioned to me about one of my children having fetal alcohol. And I thought, oh, let me look. And sure enough, I mean, well documented. Okay. Okay this is something we need to double check and see what this is. So what happened was I took my little ones to the doctor and I think I might've said this in the last episode, they were diagnosed. I mean, pretty quickly because I mean, it was obvious certain, you know, as you start to know the criteria, you know, now I know, Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, (laughs) I get it now, which led me to figure out what am I going to do? Because honestly, in my family, we were falling apart. And that's how it felt. We were falling apart. I was desperate for help. I had behavioral symptoms from my junior high, high schooler that I had to have 100% of my attention to and constantly involved in the school system because of everything happening every day. And then I had this little one at home, not sleeping, having all these behavioral, you know, things happening. This person would trigger this person. This person would trigger this person. And we were a mess. And, um, so my husband and I found, um, I was advised to take this course through facets organization about a neurobehavioral model. And it was in that classroom that I realized in that training, hang on, it's not just my little ones. I need to do some more research. And as we were looking through the criteria and as we were doing stuff, we recognized this could be one of the reasons why we're having so many struggles with one of my other children with, you know, two of my other children. And so that sought a diagnosis. Now the hard part was seeking a diagnosis is super difficult. I ended up having to, fortunately I was in a position where I could do this. um, But I ended up flying to the university of Washington with my older kids to determine if this was true because I could not get a diagnosis here in California. Um, at their age because of all so many different variables, which are variables, which I won't get into. So we went there and we did a full diagnostic re- review and everything. And sure enough, I had, I have one child with static encephalopathy, which is an, a common um, diagnosis because of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, as well as other factors that led up to that. Okay. So like trauma and other things can increase it. And so static encephalopathy basically is, it's basically a non-changing brain-based condition. Okay. okay. And then there's alcohol-related neurodevelopmental and um, neuro uh, alcohol-related like neurobehavioral. And so that I had that one as well. And which those are the DSM diagnoses, DSM-5 diagnoses, because like I said before, FASD is not. Right. 
Well, what happened was because of all of this and this neurobehavioral approach, it changed everything on how I parented. My sure. husband and I, it gave us a whole new viewpoint of looking at things through a brain-based perspective or a brain-based lens. And so we were able to understand, okay, we need to make accommodations. We need to make modifications. We need to do this. Like specific, like, here's the task I want. Can my child, is my child able to do it? And then what does my, what does my child need to be able to do that is in a basic nutshell. I mean, there's so much more. Um, And because of that, it changed everything. Um, did it make everything perfect? And now we're like, you know, kumbaya around the campfire. No, right. we're not. Um, right. <laughs> I don't want Unfortunately, wanna... yeah, no, it's not going to work like that. Right. It doesn't work like that every day. Every moment is different, but it changed everything. And it changed the relationship with my kids, my, you know, my older kids to where I could see it wasn't a battle. It wasn't this, I'm just doing this to be the horrible teenager, quote, quote, right. that people try and say, right. um, no, it was, I am really struggling and I'm crying out for help or I need, you know, and I don't know what to do except this. So um, the struggle then after that was the school system in getting them to understand fetal alcohol, though I had all of the documentation, it was still a perception that I was making this up or that it's just a non-preferred task and my child just doesn't want to do it. And, um, and so I had to go through the whole, it's not that this child won't do it. It's that this child can't do it, or this child can't do it in the way you're asking them to do it. Right. Let's think out of the box and think of a different way to do it. So, um, so that's been my experience with my older kids. And then, you know, I'm still raising my younger ones and what it can look like. It can look, um, fetal alcohol can look like I said, it's very different for everyone. Sure. Um, some children are impacted um, minimally, and there's not a lot of behavioral symptoms associated with that. Others are highly impacted. Um, I have, I have in my home, we run the gamut. I mean, I've got an individual that pretty much could seem nearly neurotypical. Um, and I have another one that we honestly thought at one point, la- what, last year, yeah, 2021, it, around this time last year, my littlest was almost admitted into the hospital because she was not safe. And I mean, we had behaviors of eloping. We had behaviors of self-harm. We've had be- behaviors of destroying things and property. Um, we had dangerous behaviors and sayings, of, you know, statements of I want to die or I don't care if I die. And here's how I'm going to die. And, you know, red flags all over the place, right? And the child was seven. Oh. So, I mean, let's put that in perspective, right? So we were, I mean, I, it was devastating. I mean, and as a parent, I mean, you're, you have your older children saying to you, mom, you can't do this anymore. And as a mom, you're saying, I can't give up on this child, right? Right. And so- I mean, after I picked myself up off the floor from sobbing so hard, I knew I needed to take my child in for my child's safety. And um, fortunately, um, one of the things that was happening, the person that uh, evaluated my child um, had stated to me because of age and so many other traumatic events that had happened in their life had said, if this child becomes admitted into this unit, it will be, it would do more damage. It would do more trauma. And, oh, and I was advised to just work through it. Wow. And I was honestly very grateful for that advice because fortunately it was only a few days later that things started to, help, you know, turn around, you know, a little bit after all of the, uh, the people. And it's been a very long process through all of this. Um, and when I say eloping behaviors, I'm talking, climbing out of, you know, when you're camping and they're climbing out the top window of the trailer, or we've opened up the window to our bedroom and we've walked down and we're sitting on the roof. Um, things like that. I mean, I'm painting the picture now. I'm not saying that it's, everyone's going to be like this. And I don't want to think, I don't want anyone to think that, you know, oh my gosh, this is this horrible. I mean, this was our situation. Um, 
And it's not that bright, you know, because I had other children impacted that were just going about their day, stressed out from what's going on, actually ended up with anxiety and depression because of all of the, the turmoil, sure. um, which still happens. But um, that was our situation. And so we're still going through that. And then, um, you know, working through the school system, which we had to do and explaining um, what it's really like and... So yeah, it can be, I mean, there's so many more. I mean, you've, and then you've got your older kids that were going through things and there was self-harm. There was um, depression so much that I was like, look, if I, you need to talk to me now. I mean, because there's mental health things you have to ask, you know, it's red flags, you know, to say, okay, what are we doing? And I had looked at my, my child and I had said, if you don't do this, I have to call. And once we call, we lose all control of what's going to happen with you. Yeah. You know, as a teenager, I said, you need to understand where we're at. You know, fortunately, that was enough to help my child, you know, and my teenager, I should say, um, do what needed to get done. Because there was, you know, the, yeah. So, I mean, it was, it's been, there's a lot of mental health that goes along with it. um, And it's, you know, it's. It's not, and it can be a you know an easy road, and it can be really tough, and we've had a little bit of both. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So that's been my experience with my own family. Now, on the upside of that, my teenagers, I have one that's getting ready with the one that's um, more highly exposed or more highly impacted, is getting ready to start their own business. And oh, that's awesome. Yes, entrepreneur. And we're working through that and helping uh, my child do that. So the excitement is abounding and the learning process that's going on. Um, and so that's great. So, I mean, it sound it can sound like, oh, my gosh, we're in the abyss or the pit, right, of despair. Sure. Yeah. And but, you know, it's that I love that caterpillar butterfly thing. That's always been one of my favorites. And that's exactly it. I mean, it is so exactly it. And busting through those limits that all the teachers and all the staff had placed on my child. There were yeah. so many limits. There were so many times that my my child was told that basically they were going to amount to nothing. They were going to end up in jail, you know, yeah. by the time they were 20 something. Mm-hmm. And it was like, why, why, you know? And so I'm so yeah. proud of this determination and the real, I mean, it took time. You know, I think of it, my child is now 20. And just now figuring out what they want to do. And that's okay. That's oh, gosh. Right. Yeah, that's young, really. <laughs> right? I'm like, you don't have to know it when you're 18 or 17 when you're in high school. Right. You know, I didn't figure it out for a long time. And I'm still evolving, right? Right. And so to find that this child is doing this now and following their passion and they're happy, that's all that matters to me. Yeah. All that matters. You're happy and you're busting through those limits. That's fantastic. You went through a lot of grief and you're busting through it and you're working with your, um, through your challenges, you know, yes, I help, you know, I help with some of that. I, that's my job. I'm I'm (laughs) first and foremost, right. That's what I'm going to do. Um, and then we're, you know, bringing up these other ones that, you know, uh, we're, finding out what their skills are, their skills and strengths are. And we're seeing what works and what doesn't work for them. And we're seeing that traditional school environments don't work for them, my youngest yeah. ones. And that's okay. So now we're a whole new chapter, you know, and it is what it is. And for, you know, in this season of life. And so they're, you know, they're busting through some of their limits too, you know, that we're told that wasn't going to happen. So I'm seeing growth. It's slower, you know, with some of my little ones, it's slower. Yeah. Or maybe it's kind of the same, but I just didn't realize it before with my older ones. I don't know. That's so, a good point. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, that's, that is, that's an incredible synopsis because I know that there's so much more. I mean, I I didn't know you when you were going through all of those things, but just by the way that you've talked about it, I know that there were so many other things that happened and mm-hmm. both positive and negative. Um, and so I, I very much appreciate the way that you have told your story so far and your stories. We're not finished with your story. 
no problem. Um, and I, when I think about some of the behaviors that you mentioned, you know, the eloping, I'm, I was going to ask you to, to um, clarify that a little bit because that's a newer term. It's probably been around 10 or 15 years, but it's still a newer term, you know, that a lot of people, it's basically like they, they're leaving. They're you know, running, basically running away. Yeah. yeah. And They'll so escape um, out of classrooms, escape out of the house and run down the street or run away. Yeah. Yep. And yeah. And then you gave those examples. And I, I knew from a conversation that we'd had previously that, that that was some of the things that you talked about. So I was glad that you brought those up, but um, the successes that your children have had, and also the fact that I, I believe at least that you, your older ones are twins, right? Yes, correct. And so as you were talking, it was evident how very different they are and how the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder uh, displays itself Yes, in the two of them. Yes. And so I just wanted to bring that point out again that, you know, as you have, you, as you've said multiple times, it isn't going to affect everybody the same way, even twins. Correct. Who, you know, have all the rest of the genes basically that are the same. So you would think at least within twins, it would be very similar. And in your case, it definitely is not. No, not at all. You know, I mean, there could be twins where one is impacted and one is not at all. It just depends on so many variables, um, much to which we may not have all of the research knowledge because to try and do a lot of that research is very challenging, you know. Yeah. Um, but yes, they're, I mean, and I can see that or they're impacted differently, very differently. So, yes. Yeah. Crazy. That's, yeah. And the, it breaks my heart every single time when I hear, and sadly, I hear this so often of the types of comments that you said your children have heard. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, that's not part of my nature is to say those kinds of things. And so it's very difficult for me to understand where someone is coming from when they make those kinds of comments. And something that you had mentioned too, that I have noticed a lot in my teaching experience is that you're right. That hand holding, that more nurturing, that that tends to happen in those primary grades. Mm -hmm. And then when kids hit those junior high and high school levels, it isn't that the teachers don't care as much, mm -hmm. but how they display it and then what their expectations are of the students mm -hmm. is so different. And it does seem like they get more set in their ways of, well, I've got to prepare you for high school. Mm -hmm. I've got to, you know, I, I'm looking to the future. Yes. Okay. I, I understand that, but they're not at the future right now. You can right. gradually <laughs> take, you know, I mean, those of us who work in behavioral settings, you don't have all the accommodations and then just take them away, which kind of right. seems like what happens between a primary setting and a middle school setting. Right, right. You're absolutely correct. What happens is they really want to encourage independence. And what what the child may really need is interdependence. Right. They need that. They need that to continue for them to be successful because sometimes their developmental timeline is a little longer than the quote average person. So it may right. take them a little longer. So they may need more interdependence and help and and I also, I mean, I also, I get where the teachers, where teachers are coming from too, because there's these mass amount of kids coming in and out of their classroom. It's a different mass amount of kids every period. Mm -hmm. And I mean, quite frankly, I mean, you've got, to, as a teacher, you've got to adjust to each classroom's dynamic and you're in high school or junior high and high school, you have them for one whole hour or 50 minutes and you have a lot of stuff you've got to get done. So you really need a lot of compliance. Right. And when a child is struggling and can't comply, what do you do? Right. You know? And so I, I didn't have that perspective in the beginning. Of course, you know, as a parent, I was just like, what, you know, and it, it took understanding, you know, a, a lot of communication with staff and teachers to, to recognize and have that empathy towards teachers in settings. Um, but however, comma. Um, <laughs> right. Exactly. No, I know. However, I exactly. comma. Um, certain types of comments 
are not necessary. You know, I, right. I mean, I think of what I want to be spoken to that way. Would I, how would I react if someone handed me that type of, you know, conversation, so to speak? Yeah. So, and, and that's absolutely where I think my trouble with that type of stuff falls to is because yes, I understand having been a teacher, you know, I didn't have 30 kids in my classroom at a time. So I don't have that exact reference. Right. However, the the approach, again, you know, I don't understand where those kinds of comments come from. Yes, I get exactly what you said. And I'm so glad that you said it about needing, you know, look, I've got a job to do. And I need for all of you to, to help me do my job in the best way possible so I can help you be the best version of you possible. Right. Um, and yeah, there, there have to be those expectations of some compliance. But yeah, the comments, I don't understand the comments and I don't know how to change those that need for those comments or that automation of those comments, whatever it is um, that that has some people speaking that way because it's not just the few students that you know and the few students that I know. Right. If it was, the coincidence of us finding each other would be incredible. Right. So to know that this is happening all across our country and probably the world on a regular basis, some, somewhere, somehow, we have to teach empathy better or teach how to teach better or. I think a lot of it is self-awareness too for, for everyone is yeah. what is triggering me? Why? And why am I acting this way? What is yes, my, sir. what is my, what is an unspoken value that I have that you are challenging me right now that I feel the need that I have to combat you with something yes. to protect myself or to get you to comply. So yes. what is it within me that your behaviors or your statements are triggering in me that is creating that response. Yeah, that's I, beautiful. I think you are spot on with that. Thank you. So, <laughs> I'm, I mean, that's just what I think of, you know, and then as a parent, we think of the same thing. You know, one of the things that we say in our own home um, is because it's very easy as parents, especially when we're frustrated. There are children, right? We want this, et cetera, et cetera. If this same exact situation happened to, in, you know, I used to volunteer in the classroom all the time. Say it was another child, right? Mm -hmm. It was someone else's child that did this exact same thing my child is doing. How would I treat that child? If right. I would treat that child differently than I treat my child, then what I'm doing with my child is wrong or in my opinion. Okay. I cannot be nicer to someone else's child than my own. And right. if I'm going to be more patient and understanding, empathetic here with this other person's child, then how how much more do I need to do that with my own child so that they can be understood and feel successful and all of that? So, yeah. And I actually think in reverse as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I that's always what kind of guided me was if this was my child in someone else's classroom, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what would I want them to say or how would I want them to treat my child? Mm -hmm. And if I have this expectation of teachers treating my child this way, then that's exactly where my expectation should be for me treating someone else's child that way. Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, so I, I don't... I don't know if it's a class that has to be taught about being self-aware or if it's, I don't know what we have to do, but like I said, I, th there seems like there's a missing component. Mm -hmm. that, and that's a big ask. I mean, that's a yeah. lot of people, but yes, it's a big ask yeah. for sure. So, yeah, but I, th I think that's so very true. The whole self-aware thing is, is I, when I went through college to be a teacher, um, there was a, a gentleman who uh, his name is Howard Gardner and they were talking to us about his theory of multiple intelligences. And instead of just like, Oh, you're all naturally book smart or you're not naturally book smart. And so if you're not naturally book smart, you're not smart is kind of the way that we tend to look at things. Um, he said, no, that's, I don't, I don't believe that at all. And he had, I think it was seven or eight at the time 
And I think there's a few more that he has discovered since then of ways that each of us has a strength of intelligence. Mm -hmm. And two of them were intrapersonal and interpersonal. Mm -hmm. And those, I think for me, are very high of my intelligence abilities. And so for anyone who doesn't know, that means knowing myself and understanding other people. Mm -hmm. And that whole self-aware thing falls right in there of being aware of what I am saying and how that might affect someone else, mm -hmm. but also how I'm thinking. That that was so beautiful how you worded that before of what is it that I have a, a value or a need that is being endangered right now by somebody else. Mm -hmm. And that's so important. And I'm for myself able to do a lot of that. Um, but I, I think it's a skill that can be taught to me. I feel it's a natural thing, but I think it's something that can be taught. Right. And I'm hoping that's kind of actually one of the reasons for hashtag no limits is, is to try to change that perspective in a lot of people of how they're approaching those that are interacting with them every day. And it doesn't have to necessarily be somebody who has a disability. It's just people in general. Exactly. We are, very, we are very quick to react. Mm -hmm. so that's why, that's why I like to teach and share the neurobehavioral approach to parenting and working and teaching, educating and, and working with individuals that are impacted by FASD and other brain-based, you know, neurodiverse conditions. Um, because it does change your whole your whole perspective, and it it changed it changed how I parented, and and I've seen the effects of it in my own home, and that's why I like to share it with others to do to help them as much as possible, and it's been great because I mean there's been some you know some individuals that are like it it changed the relationship with their with their child, and that's huge, and I and I and I know that because it did that for me. Right. So to know that it's helping someone else just makes me, I mean, that goes along with my life's mission of making a positive difference in the lives of others. And so I just, you know, just want to help everyone out, but I can. Yeah. Shout it from the rooftop. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's do it. Let's shout it. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. So we've talked about your personal experiences within your own family. Let's talk mm -hmm. about your business and how, and you kind of just hinted at that. So that was a perfect little segue, oh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> of how you are working with those in the community and um, individuals through your business. And, and again, I'm sorry, I think it was divine. What did you say? It was divinely designed? So close. Diversely designed. Diversely designed. Diversely okay. designed. <laughs> because it's basically from neurodiversity. We're all diverse. Every brain is different. Your brain is going to think differently than mine. Um, so what I basically do is I educate and um, about neurodiverse conditions, and I um, facilitate the neurobehavioral approach to parenting and educating and working with individuals with neurodiverse conditions, specifically FASD um, as well. But this neurobehavioral approach works all across the board, no matter if you're neurodiverse or neurotypical. And so I educate in either online courses or in person. I have done um, large trainings for organizations and for, you know, social workers so that, you know, it's important for um, children that have, you know, that unfortunately are removed from their home, that they are screened because that makes a better placement and to limit disruptions um, when a foster parent is not prepared to handle um, that type of situation. And um, so I've done large trainings. I've done small group trainings. I've done supports, um, coaching. Um, right now I am in the middle of um, working with a, a family and um, helping everyone understand as well, you know, the, uh, what's going on. And, and that's what I do, just personal coaching as well. Um, all sorts of things. I mean, as well as helping up at the IEP table as well, a whole other side of the, the spectrum and, and helping the individuals that have, you know, that may have FASD with their IEPs because it is different. It's not the same. It's not your typical, Oh, just, you know, provide a rubber band at the bottom of the chair and everything's going to be fine. And that's going to help their ADHD. You know, it's not that 
and it's it's helping individual because it's usually categorized under ADHD. And so it's easily missed. Um, and so that's basically what I do. I educate and I, um, I train and I coach and that is what I do to help families. And um, I love it. I love it because I, I believe in it. I believe in how well it works because I've seen it myself. Yeah. Right. And, and that is so incredibly important about the foster families, because like you said, you, um, you want to make that transition mm -hmm. as smooth as possible, as well as for the families who are adopting. And so having as much information about the possibilities of things that could come right. would absolutely be critical, I would think. Um, it is. And it's a shortcoming in the system. Foster parents are not trained on fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And a lot of times things are labeled as, oh, it's trauma or, oh, it's attachment. And why that can't, while yes, that can be true, there could be also another underlying issue that really needs to be understood in order for um, there to be limited um, disruptions in placement and also to equip families that when they're reunified so that they are set up for success because if you are trying to get your life together and you have no idea about your child that has this you're trying to still take care of you and if you have I mean that we're setting you up for a, a failure if we don't so that's the other piece of the puzzle so yes yeah very so I, I presume with what you do you do it just locally or are you able to work no you're able to work with families virtually oh absolutely absolutely okay. i work with families virtually as well as uh like one of the ones that i'm working with now is like four hours away from me um and we're just meeting online at this point um i can do in persons as well and i do trainings um like i said in person i've flown and gone places to train um and it's great i love it you know, of course, COVID kind of, you know, stopped that for a while, but yeah. it seems like it's getting back. And I'm super excited about that because I love that human interaction because there's so much benefit when we are in a group together and the, the exercises that we do and the, the role playing that we do and the, you know, just so much goes into when you're in person. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. So um, we are pre-recording this, but I want to um, let everybody know how they will be able to get a hold of you if they want to know more information about you or your services. Is it what's the is it a website or? Yes, I do have a website. Um, you can either do diversitydesigned.com or you can do shannonyakabachi.com. It's the same one, but diversely designed might be a little bit easier to remember how to spell than my last name. <laughs> so <laughs> I put it out both out there. So it all leads to the same place. Um, so it just go on there and it tells you what I have and it tells you how to get a hold of me and, um, if, you know, feel free to email me and that type of thing. And then we can always chit chat and yeah, I mean, yeah you know, awesome. if you need help or if you have questions, that's what I'm here for. That's what I'm here yeah. for. And you have been such a great route of, of information and knowledge um, these last two weeks. And I think I could have you on another time and we could just continue to talk because it's, you're so easy to talk to and you have such great knowledge and it's obviously a passion of yours. I mean, it, it comes through in your facial expressions and the things that you say. And so um, we're not finished yet. I, I do have one more thing that I want to talk to you about, but um I just want to encourage anybody right now, you know, if you are interested in reaching out to Shannon, um, if for some reason I don't remember to put the information in there, um, please, you all know how to get a hold of me, you know, just leave me a message on this episode when it airs um, and I will get you the information to reach Shannon directly. I want to finish up today with the legislation that you are working on. You, you kind of hinted at that at the beginning. <laughs> and um, interestingly enough, after our talk the first time, I met another person who is also, and I don't, I think it's the same legislation that you guys are working on, or maybe um, there's something here in Illinois that's different than California, but I thought this lady told me it was a federal thing. So mm -hmm. let's talk about the legislation that you're working on. Okay. So it is called the FASD Respect Act. And if you would like to know all the details about it, because I can't like spew them all out because there's so many of them, you can go to FASDunited.org 
And there's a whole bunch of information on there about the Respect Act. It is a bipartisan bill that is basically not just raising awareness, but also to um, improve diagno diagnostic clinics, to help with funding for supports and services, just a whole bunch, a whole slew of services and, and understandings for individuals that are impacted by FASD, as well as awareness and, and prevention and interventions and all of the things. Um, so we are working on that. And so that is Yes, perfect. Um, I just so realized I, I, do that. I, I did not know you could do I that. Put, I should have put your name in there before when you were talking. <laughs> um, so FASDunited.org is amazing. And so they have a whole policy center on their website about, about the FASD Respect Act. In addition, in California, we're trying to work on, um, it was just actually just presented on Valentine's Day, a bill to have FASD as a qualifying category for IEPs. Wow, that's so cool, so, which would be super amazing um, to have that happen. So um, that, like I said, just, just happened on Valentine's Day. So that's so awesome. Like, right. Perfect timing. And um, <laughs> <laughs> so those are the legislative, um, you know, bills that we are working on right now. So please go to FASDunited.org if you want to know more about it and talking to your senators and your representatives about this bill is crucial. And that's how we gain support um, to have it become approved. So that is, that's incredible. And I was, I was just talking and thinking about this the other day with somebody about when the last time idea was reauthorized and that was 2004 and it's time. It needs to be reauthorized again, in my opinion. Um, and I know it's a huge and daunting, time-consuming process, but it needs to be done. There's been a lot of things that have developed in the last 18 years. And while I'm talking, did I spell diversely designed in what's dot com? That's okay. perfect. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. I'm so I'm so glad I happened to look over to the side and go, oh, you know, I think I could do this. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I've only been awesome. using the platform for like two years and I'm still figuring things out. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Perfect. But yeah, that, that's how I am, folks. I, yeah, I just. It's okay. Smart. We all have our own learning curve. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. Oh, my goodness. Well, at least I have it there. So if I forget to put go. it in the notes, it at least showed up on the screen this time. Right, um, right. I'll have, to, I'll have to remember that for the future. But but yeah, um, sorry, I'm a little squirrely about that. But yeah, the, there's so much that has changed in mm -hmm. almost 20 years. Right. And um, yeah, I know it's a big process, but it, it definitely needs to be redone and to have to have that knowledge that that might be an eligibility that will be um, made possible. That's, that's pretty cool. That's that would be cool. cool. That would be cool. It's only California's level right now, but sometimes, you know, it takes one or two states I, to do it, to push to for. So yeah. fingers crossed that it yeah. works. So absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Well, we um, are, we've got about, Five minutes left of when I say we absolutely have to cut off. So um, I just want to give you opportunity if there's anything else. You, I mean, I, I'm sure you have more, but at the same time, I'm like, gosh, you've shared so much. I don't know if you have more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I could talk about this forever, but. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you can. And that's what I'm saying. There's so much, but at the same time, yeah. So is yeah. there anything else, you know, that you, any words of encouragement that you have or just any final thoughts? Yeah, actually, I would like to encourage uh, because if you are a parent or a professional that is working with an individual that may have FASD, it's not a lost cause. I, you, and your child is not broken. OK, a lot of people think my child is broken or how can I fix my child? Yeah. Your child is not broken. It's just a different approach that we need to take. And success can happen. And success is different for everybody. And it's just being open to what success looks like for that individual. And so um, just understanding that, um, I mean, I, I have one that's already getting ready to start a business. So, I mean, and that's their success and their passion and what they want to do. And so um, I just want to encourage you. Yes, I know it's hard. Trust me, I am there in the day to day. I know how hard it is and emotionally draining and physically exhausting and mentally challenging it is. Um, don't lose hope because, um, you know, there's the other side of the rainbow. 
I mean, it really, there really can be success. It yeah. can. That's so, awesome. Yeah. And, and I've not met your children, um, but I have a feeling that they are absolutely beautiful and are becoming even more beautiful every day because of all of the knowledge that you have, all of the research that you've done and the passion that you have for them and also for FASD and everything that is involved with that. And uh, again, I so appreciate you coming on twice <laughs> and sharing all that you have shared with me and with my audience. And I, I hope that this will encourage people, give them knowledge that they didn't have before and change their perspective. Me too. Me too. Thanks everybody. Have a great day. Hey, parents and teachers, are you tired of IEP meetings that feel like a battle? Let's put an end to the tension and create a collaborative, calm, and respectful environment together. Shelly Kino, your go-to IEP consultant, can transform your meetings into positive and productive experiences. With Shelly Kino, your child is her top priority, your voice is heard, and you become confident. Shelly Kino is making the world better for all, one IEP at a time. Visit www.shellykino.com for more information and set up your free 20-minute consultation today. That's shellykino.com, S-H-E-L-L-E-Y-K-E-N-O-W.